And we're actually just not going to worry about patient care because we are still a little bit ahead in that class. The next chapter is extraordinarily short, and I don't want to get done super early, so we're going to save that for after the Thanksgiving break. Go ahead and do our Rad Pro class now. We'll end about 1045, and unless everyone is just horribly opposed to it, you'll get an early out today. It'll be my little Thanksgiving gift to you this week. I think we're all on board with that. Yes? Anybody opposed? Me either. Sounds like a good plan. Sounds like a good plan. So you're going to need all that extra time to get yourself ready for all that heavy Thanksgiving food. I know I will. Going to my, my parents on a Thursday, and my mom cooks very heavy food, which destroys me internally, but it is very, very tasty. Being someone who is heavily lactose intolerant like me, Thanksgiving's never a fun holiday. I mean, I enjoy the food, but man, that food, my mom cooks with really heavy cream and milk and all kinds of stuff. It just destroys me. It's like a, it's like a totally worth it sickness though, I would say. So I am looking forward to the food. I'm not looking forward to the after effects of the food. At least I have a whole weekend to recover from that. You're gluten intolerant. I can't say I'm gluten intolerant, but I am heavily lactose intolerant. Cross the bridge when you get there, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right, guys. So it looks like WebEx decided to work today. Thank God. I'm not having any of the same issues like on Friday, so I think we can actually get through this lecture. So we're going to go ahead and move forward on Rad Pro 2. I believe we left off on the pelvis. Get this all pulled up, and we'll get moving right along here. So if you remember when we're talking about the pelvis, we have there in that first little section, the routine projections, and that does include the AP and the bilateral frog leg. Now you'll see a bilateral frog leg is part of the routine, but most of the time, at least in my experience, and even here at Harris Health, most of the time a routine pelvis is just going to consist of one view and that's just the AP. Typically that bilateral frog leg, even though it's considered a routine exam, is more so ordered as an extra exam if the doctors want to see a lateral view of those hips. So yes, it's routine, but as far as the protocols go here at Harris Health in most facilities, AP is usually all they're going to ask for, which if you remember me saying on Friday, that's a really great thing because that one view would be all you'd need for the competency. Very easy competency to get, great competency to get. Now when we talk about the hip, it's a little different. Now hip, the routines are considered AP, unilateral, frog lateral, and Demilius Miller. That's a little deceptive as well. Now, for a hip, you're always going to do an AP and lateral, period. You'll have the AP and the frog leg lateral on one side. Because you're only doing one hip unless they order bilateral hips. Danelius Miller, while it's considered a routine, you're only ever going to do the Danelius Miller if the patient can't um, position their leg for a normal lateral. In other words, you're doing a cross-table lateral for that hip exam. So, yes, it's routine, but it's only done when it's in a trauma case and the patient cannot move their leg into a typical lateral. Now, as far as the special projections, we have a few that we're going to go over. We have the inlet and outlet views. We have the Jude view for the pelvis. Those are all three for the pelvis. And for the hip, we have what's called the Clements Nakayama lateral. We're going to go over each of those specifically. Um, as far as those being done, the inlet, outlet, and Jude views, you'll actually see those done quite a bit at the Ben Top Bone Clinic. They do those quite a bit here. So you will see those special views a little more often. Clements Nakayama, I've actually, that's one of those more rare ones you're not going to see very often, but that is going to be considered what we call a special projection, special projection. So no, as always, the difference between those routines versus special projections. So we are going to start with the AP hip. Now there's a little trick with this pelvis. After I go through this criteria, I'm going to tell you a little trick for these pelvis x-rays. It works like a charm as far as centering. So of course, with a pelvis, guys, same as with the femur, we're never going to stand anybody up for a pelvis. 
That's never going to be done. They're always going to be lying down in supine position. They'll never be in a prone position. It's only ever done lying down, supine, and that can be done either tabletop or table bucky, preferably in the table because, as you can realize, the pelvis is a very thick area, very thick area to penetrate. We want to go ahead and utilize that grid underneath the table for that pelvis x-ray to clean up that x-ray and give us an overall better looking picture. Now, for the position, you remember, guys, that most, posi- that most important part of doing that AP pelvis is we're going to have those legs straight out in front of us with the feet rotated medially 15 to 20 degrees. We want to touch those toes together. In fact, I always tell my patients, touch your toes together like this. I'll, I'll use my hand signals. Touch your toes together like this. Most people can figure that out. And that's going to put those femurs in the correct position where we can see more of the greater trochanter and less of the lesser trochanter. That's what we're looking for on that pelvis. We don't want the feet going to the sides. That's going to be in proper position. It must, they must have those feet internally rotated. And that's probably what people miss the most on a pelvis x-ray. When you put a big star on that, you always got to rotate those feet medially. Otherwise, it's going to be improperly positioned on that pelvis. A lot of people will be in a hurry. They'll be doing a competency. You'll be doing a test out. You get everything just right. You forget to turn the feet inwards. Do not forget that very important detail on that pelvis x-ray. 40-inch SID. It's always going to be 40-inch SID, just like everything else in this chapter is 40-inch SID. Now, for the CR location, the central ray is going to be a perpendicular beam, no angulation, and it's going to be approximately midway between the level of the as-is and the symphysis pubis along the MSP. A little bit complicated. There's actually an easier way to center for this. I'm going to share that once I go through all this criteria. But this is the technical central location for the pelvis you need to know. Halfway between as-is and symphysis pubis. Now, you guys should have learned in lab how to palpate that as-is. Make sure you know the difference between the as is and the iliac crest because that's a very that's two very easy landmarks to mix up. People mix up quite often. Make sure you know that difference on a person's um, anatomy. Now the IR must be a 14 by 17 cassette, and this is very vital as well. People will often mix this up. They'll put their IR lengthwise. It needs to always be landscape or crosswise. Why the pelvis is quite wide. And we want to make sure we include that entire pelvis on that x-ray. We're not going to do uppers and lowers. It needs to be all on one. We achieve that by having that crosswise landscape cassette. Very important. That's probably the second thing people mix up the most on pelvis x-ray, aside from turning those feet inward. Collimation, you're going to have a full field. And that's great. You don't have to worry about collimation, period, on a pelvis. You want that wide open. Leave that, leave that collimation wide open vertically and um, horizontally completely open because we want that entire pelvis table bucky is preferred as i said before to clean up that scatter you do want to utilize table bucky when possible the only time you would do tabletop for a pelvis is if you're in a trauma room you're doing a portable and you're having to put that cassette directly under the patient's body as a free cassette exam now shielding there is a difference here make sure you know the difference between male and female on shielding you're only ever going to shield the gonads of a male you're not going to shield on a female. On that's, that's period on pelvis x-rays. Now, there are available certain kinds of shields for females. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a little bit. But it is not required. It's optional for females, but it is required for males because you can still shield the testes quite easily on a pelvis x-ray. Now, what's the trick on the pelvis I was talking about? It's a little weird. It's kind of difficult when you're trying to send, center halfway between as is and sims is pubis, but there's a little trick you can do. Because you can leave that collimation field wide open on that 14 by 17 crosswise, what's great is if you look at the top of the light of your light field, fill for the iliac crest, and if you put the top of that light one inch above that iliac crest, you're clearing the pelvis and you're centered exactly in the middle where you need to be on the pelvis. We'll say that again. Find your iliac crest. You have your field wide open, crosswise. Put two fingers down at the top of the crest. If the top of your light is an inch above that iliac crest, you are centered exactly where you need to be for that pelvis x-ray. Works like a charm. Because it can be kind of difficult to guesstimate halfway between as is and symphysis pubis. You can't palpate symphysis pubis. And a lot of people mix up as is with iliac crests. So that's an excellent option for you guys. I really suggest it if you're having trouble centering for that x-ray. Because centering can be a big problem on pelvis x-rays. A lot of times people will end up cutting the crest off, so be very careful on that. Look for the top of that light. 
look at the top of that light, be an inch above that iliac crest. It's exactly what you need to do. All right, so did that make sense, guys? Because that really is a great strategy for searching for those pelvis x-rays. Because I can tell you the method between as-is and symphysis pubis can be quite difficult. It's even difficult for me because it's really easy to mix up as-is between iliac crest, which you're we in a hurry, less thinking overall. You just put that light right above the crest. I think that's centering right on the money every single time. And we call it the drip method. That's what my seniors would call the drip method. Lots of drip methods coming, don't worry. All right, guys, so what's the evaluation criteria for that pelvis? Well, here we go. We, of course, want the entire pelvis from top to bottom. You want the iliac crest all the way down to that ischial tuberosity, the entirety of that pelvis centered to that crosswise cassette. Entire pelvis and also the proximal femora must be included. Now, the proximal femora will be included if you have the ischial tuberosities on that film, as you can see right here. And you want no rotation of the pelvis. Now, that can be deceptive. You'd say, well, that's easy. If I just have them in an AP position, well, why would it be rotated? Well, think about it. If you're in severe pain on your pelvis, what are you going to do? You're going to rotate to the opposite side so it doesn't hurt as much. So you're really going to watch your patients on an AP pelvis and make sure that that patient is not shifting their hips before you take that x-ray. Because they'll do that on you when you're not looking. Make sure they are flat on their back in a true supine because they will shift that weight to the unaffected side and oblique the pelvis. And it's very easy to do. And if they just slightly oblique those hips, it's going to throw that entire pelvis off. So always ensure they are flat on their back. If they're in a lot of pain, sometimes you can help kind of put some pillows under their knees to support the weight a little bit. That'll help. But it is vital that they are in a true AP or that entire pelvis x-ray is not be diagnostic quality. And I guarantee you that radiologist is going to call them right back over to have you repeat that x-ray. Now, we want the lesser trochanters to not be visible or as invisible as possible. How do we achieve that? Once again, 15 to 20 degree medial rotation, touching the toes. That's what's going to achieve those lesser trochanters as hidden as possible. We want the greater trochanters in profile. Lesser trochanters need to be as hidden as possible. Then, of course, optimal exposure factors, shielding on males, optional on females. And that would be your typical evaluation criteria for an AP pelvis. And you'll see at the top of the film here, See how we got this space right above the crest? That's what I'm talking about. If you find that iliac crest, you put two fingers on top of that crest, put the top of your light above those two fingers, you're going to get a centered x-ray just like this film right here. I mean, it works beautifully. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to center for those pelvis x-rays. Works like a charm. Just make sure you know the actual central ray location. Don't, don't write my method on the test. That's not in the book. That's just my recommendation. Yes, Jessely. You said to like pop it for the iliac crest, right? So couldn't we just tell the patient to like point to their belly button, belly button and then go two inches up that way? No, that's actually not a good idea. You know why? While the belly button can't line up with the crest properly sometimes, some people's belly buttons are higher or lower than others, especially if people have had surgery. Belly buttons shift locations. So that's not, a, that's not the most reliable method. So yes, it can work sometimes. I would not use that every time, though, because that can actually throw you way off. I would go ahead and palpate for it, put the two fingers down, put that light right above that location. Okay, thank you. Beware of those belly buttons. They can be deceptive, I'm telling you. Very deceptive. Especially for women who've had C-sections. That can really shift the location of that belly button. Good question, though. Okay, so when they do call for a lateral exam on a pelvis, that's going to be what we call the AP, bilateral frog leg. We are going to frog leg both legs. That's why it's called bilateral. Now, they are still going to be in the AP supine position, same as that pelvis. We're not ever going to do the standing up. It must be done on the table only, in the supine position only. What are we going to do with those legs? We're going to actually abduct those femurs 40 to 45 degrees. How do we achieve that? Well, there's a little trick to it. You probably learned in lab already. Put the plantar surfaces of the feet touching together. It's going to put those legs in that natural 45-degree angle. Let them relax them as much as possible. Make sure they're not bringing their legs way up sharply. You can let them relax those legs down. And that's going to achieve bilateral, lateral 
hip x-rays, essentially. And it's also what we call lateral pelvis, in a sense, bilateral frog-like projection. 40-inch SID still, just like everything else we've been talking about. Now, where does the central ray go? This one, you can't exactly use the same trick. You do need to go ahead and put your central ray three inches below as is. So when I said you need to make sure you know how to palpate that as is, that's more important on the bilateral frog leg than with the AP pelvis because you cannot use the light method on the bilateral. You go a little bit lower than you would for AP pelvis because they're very interested in those hip joints. So you're going to palpate for the as is, put about three to four fingers down, whatever three inches works for you. Everyone has different size fingers. Three inches below the as is along the MSP of the patient's body. And you know, I don't know if you guys learned in lab, but a great way to find the MSP, you always ask that patient to point to the tip of their sternum, xiphoid process. Don't call it xiphoid process. Patients don't think you're speaking another language. They don't know what that is. Ask them to point to the bottom of their breast bone or sternum, and that will be your MSP. You can line that crosshair up with that and get a nice central exam. 14 by 17 cassette, we're still crosswise. We're not ever going to do this lengthwise. Same concept. We want that entire pelvis on this x-ray as much as possible, especially those hip joints because we're doing those hip joints in a lateral position. Make sure you're only using 14 by 17. You can leave that collimation wide open. It's full filled. You don't need to actually collimate on this exam either. It makes it a lot easier on you. And table bucky preferred, just like with the AP, clean up that scatter radiation. It's a thicker area of the body. we got to use increased techniques. Therefore, you need that grid and that table to clean up that image and give it a lot more quality overall. Only time, once again, you would do a tabletop exam would be in a trauma case, portable. That's the only time you would do that outside of a table. If you're doing it portably, try to utilize a grid that's going to clean up that image overall for you. And then gonadal shielding, if possible. Same concept, guys. Required on males, optional on females. The AP bilateral frog leg projection. So this would be ordered alongside an AP pelvis if they wanted to see those hips in a lateral position. But like I said, a lot of times they're just going to order that AP pelvis by itself. This would be like an extra view they would ask for if they're suspecting something going on in those hips. But remember, the trick to that, guys, is putting those plantars or those feet together. It's going to put those legs in that natural 40 to 45 degree abduction. And we'll see right here, there's one of those shields that's optional for women, by the way. If you're going to do that, you want to put it in that exact location right there. It's a little tough because you've got to put that shield in just the right location inside the pelvic brim. Because if you cover up pelvic anatomy, you're going to have to repeat the x-ray. That's why it's optional on females versus males. Males, we can always cover the sexual organs. For females, they're located a little bit higher so it's a little bit more risky with the shielding aspect on females. And if you're really good at it, go for it. So I always encourage shielding. But it is indeed optional for females just because it's going to risk covering up some of that pelvic anatomy. And you'll end up exposing them more if you have to repeat that x-ray because you covered something up. So always keep that in mind. And that's what it would look like, by the way, guys, if you were going to use a shield for a female. You want to put that shield right inside that pelvic brim like you see right here. If this was up higher and covering up parts of the pelvis, we'd have to repeat that x-ray. If it was too low, covering up the pubic symptoms, we'd have to repeat that x-ray. So, like I said before, it's very risky. I always encourage shielding. I mean, I'm very pro-shielding. But do keep in mind, it's optional in females just because of the risk of going to repeat those films. Males, you can always put the shield well below the pubic symphysis, so it's not a risk of cutting off anatomy. Now, what's our evaluation criteria for the AP bilateral frog leg? Well, here we go. We, of course, still want that pelvic girdle centered horizontally. No rotation of the pelvis. Same concept. If they're in pain, they're going to shift their weight to the opposite side to compensate for that pain in their pelvis. So you got to watch them very carefully. Don't let them shift that weight. they oblique the pelvis. And one way you can tell very easily that a pelvis is oblique, I'll show you more films as we move forward in this chapter, these obturator foramina will start to close depending on what side's obliqued. You want those obturator foramina to be equidistant on each side, completely open, to show that they're in that nice true AP position. We do want the lesser trochanters to be equal in size. That means we're not rotated. And by the way, we are seeing the lesser trochanters on the AP um, bilateral. 
frog leg versus the AP, where we wanted to see the greater choke canters. So in this position, the greater, can greater choke canters are actually superimposed completely on that femur. And we can see the lesser choke canters a nice, beautiful profile. And of course, our optimal exposure factors, as with everything we do. And you will notice on this x-ray, guys, because you're going a little bit lower, it is acceptable on the bilateral frog leg to clip a little bit of the iliac crest. Not much, but if it's just barely clipped up here like you see, that's considered acceptable because the main thing they're evaluating on this bilateral frog leg is the femurs and the hip joints. AP pelvis will go ahead and cover all this area. That's not going to change in this position. So it is acceptable to cut a little bit of that iliac crest off on this bilateral frog leg for the pelvis. Mr. Donner, you said um, if, they're, if they're oblique, you'll see the operator foramen, the, the opening is a little smaller, is that what you're saying? Correct. They'll start to close off. And I'm going to show you some examples of that when we do some image critiques. Okay. As you look towards certain sides, they'll start to close. And that's an indication that that patient has obliqued themselves, or they obliqued them accidentally. And you always want them to be completely open of the exact same shape and size on either side to show when you the truth. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, would, would you say this one is a little oblique? Just looking at it, it looks like it looks like the one on the right is like a tad bit smaller. Very good eyes, Jonathan. Very good eyes. It is. It is okay. very, very slightly, not much. Like this would not be enough to repeat. But it's very, very, very slightly. I mean, very slightly oblique. It's probably okay. just a tiny bit. Good eyes on that. Good eyes. Thanks. Might, might be future quality assurance tech there, guys. Watch out. He's going to get you on your films. <laughs> I do not. Okay, guys, so now we're going to talk about the hip a little bit. We do have the AP hip, also known as a proximal femur. Why? Because we're also visualizing the proximal femur as well as the hip. So this would be what we call an AP unilateral hip. When you see the word unilateral, you know you're looking at one side only. Bilateral, of course, referring to both sides together. So for an AP unilateral hip, same concept, guys. We're only ever going to do this lying down. would never be done standing up or sitting up. They must be in the supine position only, never prone. And we're going to have that leg extend straight out in front of them with that foot rotated 15 to 20 degrees medially. 15 to 20 degrees medially. And that's very important once again because we want the greater trochanter in profile with that lesser trochanter to be as obscured as possible and not visible. Like because we have that foot in proper position, and that's another one of these things that you people will often forget in this position. They'll forget to move that foot inward. They'll keep it relaxed to the side. It's actually not going to demonstrate that femur how we want to. And that would not be an acceptable diagnostic exam. SID is still 40 inches. I'm going to say that over and over again because everything's 40 inches in this chapter. No 72-inch SIDs. Now, our CR must be perpendicular to the femoral neck. And a great way to palpate for that is if you put your hand on the patient's hip right here, you see where this dot is, guys? When you put your hand on the patient's hip, and you ask them to wiggle their foot back and forth like this, how I'm moving my hand, wiggle that foot back and forth, you can feel the head of that femur shifting. You can even do that to yourself right now. If you put your hand on the side of your hip and move your leg back and forth, you can feel the head of your femur moving. If you put your central ray lined up with that head of that femur, that's essentially the same, same exact location as that femoral neck, and that would be exactly where you want that central ray to be, as long as you're also lying along the central portion of the entire femur. So that's a great way to find that centralization point. Um, I don't know how you guys learned it in lab. You guys probably did the pencils. Did you guys do the pencils in the lab? Or no? Okay, good. I don't like the pencil method. Anyway, that's a really great method for finding that femoral neck, guys. It's very reliable. Ask that patient to wiggle that foot around. You can find that femoral head. Put your crosshair along that section and you'll be on that femoral neck now for the ir size it's going to be much smaller than a pelvis we're looking at a much smaller area therefore we are going to use a 10 by 12 and it's going to change to a lengthwise cassette because we're only interested in the one side the one hip we're using a lengthwise portrait size cassette and we're going to go ahead and use that full field collimation again you don't need to collimate down you can leave it open at a 10 by 12 that's going to cover that anatomical area perfectly also, still on the table bucky, guys, same concept. Only, only time you would ever do this outside of a table bucky is if you're doing a portable and that patient could not 
come down to the departments. Otherwise, you want to utilize that table bucket to give you a much more quality image overall. If you're going to do it portable, same thing, guys. Use a grid, clean up that scatter, give you a much prettier x-ray overall because the hip is quite thick. It's a lot more area to penetrate compared to other parts of the body. Now, for the shielding, you can go ahead and shield on an AP hip for males and females because you can easily put that shield over the area close to the pubic symphysis. Because we aren't looking at that entire pelvis, we're only interested in that one side of that hip. You'll see it says right here, make sure that the collimation and surgery include the entire symphysis pubis. Collimation is optional. You see right here, you can do full field collimation. If you leave that collimation wide open, you're not going to have to worry about including that symphysis pubis. It's going to be on there. But you do need to make sure the symphysis pubis is on that AP hip x-ray. Don't cut it off if you decide to do that tight collimation. Mr. Donahue, I have a question. Yeah, for, comps, for comps, do we need to show shielding for the unilateral hip? Yes. And it's pretty easy to do because the shielding, as you can see, covers quite a bit of area. As long as your light's barely touching that shield, it's going to show up just fine. And there's a little glow that appears on the films that show that you're shielding. We can tell if you've shielded or not. So, yeah, make sure you're shielding. It's, it's very important. Your pelvis, it's a little, you got a little wiggle room. Pelvis, male is only, female is optional. But for hip, male and female, you do want to go ahead and utilize shielding. You can cover up those organs quite easily. All right, so what are we looking for? Well, there you go. There's our evaluation criteria. We do want the proximal one-third of that femur to be completely included on that AP hip x-ray. And we also need to see that hip joint space and acetabulum completely visualized. How do we do that? Well, once again, it's all down to that position of the foot. we got to make sure we're turning that foot in medially to the degree required to make sure that we not only have that greater trochanter in profile, but we're also able to visualize that hip joint very beautifully, nice and open like you see right here, beautiful acetabulum. That's what we want to see exactly as it shows on this picture here. Symphysis pubis included, very important. What do you notice about this x-ray right here? Is that acceptable? No, it is not, because the symphysis pubis is clipped on that x-ray. Be very careful on that. That's probably the easiest thing to clip on a hip x-ray. Make sure that symphysis pubis is on that film. You must have it, or you're going to have to repeat that x-ray. Lesser trochanter needs to be completely hidden. How do we do that? Once again, it's from turning that foot in medially. Greater trochanter is in a beautiful profile here with that lesser trochanter, nice and obscured on the surface of that femur. Now, very important, I think I brought this up when we were going over the, the pathologies the other day. If that patient does have an orthopedic prosthesis, you must include the entire prosthesis. That's for hips and pelvis x-rays, by the way. In other words, if that prosthesis was going down below this x-ray, we'd have to go ahead and do another x-ray to include that entire prosthesis. You must visualize the entire prosthesis, period. Must be done. And that's a big star question right there. That's something registry might ask you. Big circle on that one. Must always have the entire orthopedic prosthesis demonstrated. Okay, so when we're doing a lateral hip, now don't mix this up with the other one. For a lateral hip, it's going to be called a unilateral frog leg projection. So the bilateral frog leg is for the pelvis. Unilateral frog leg is for the one side of the hip. Don't mix those up. It has an alternate name, by the way. It's also called the modified cleaves method. So it can be called unilateral frog leg or modified cleaves method. Now, for the, for the hip, they'll always go ahead and order a lateral hip with an AP hip every single time. A lot of times with the protocols at Harris Health as well, though, they're going to order an AP pelvis with one unilateral hip on the side. It depends on what they're looking for. So you can expect that sometimes as well. But if they do have an AP hip, they're always going to include this lateral as well. Now, how do we position? We're still in the supine position. Same concept, guys. It must be supine, not prone. And as far as how we're going to position that leg, and it's one side, by the way, once again, we're going to abduct that femur 40 to 45 degrees. And we're going to make sure that we place the plantar surface of that foot on the table like you see up here. 
Now, if they absolutely have to, they can relax their leg down, like you see in this picture right here on the bottom left. But it's preferred that you have this femur abducted 40 to 45 degrees with that foot flat on the table to achieve that true lateral position of that proximal femoral area. 40 inch SID still, CR is still going to be perpendicular to the femoral neck. So what's great, guys, uh, there's a little trick for this one too I'm going to show you. But if you, found, if you found your central ray location for your AP hip, it doesn't change for the lateral. It's literally in the exact same location. The only thing they're doing differently is changing the position of the leg or putting it in that frog leg position. But let's say you, you screwed up your centering because the patient moved on you. One thing that you can do is you'll notice whenever you bend the leg, I wish I could show you guys this in person because it's a little hard to show in this picture. If I was to move this leg back and forth, the leg forms a crease right here at the hip joint. You know what I'm talking about? A crease, a little fold or crease. If you put your crosshair on the crease of the leg, that's going to be the exact location of that femoral neck. So that's not in the book, once again. That's, that's, that's my method. But if you look at that little, it's going to give you a perfect centralized location for that frog leg lateral hip x-ray. Works like a charm. Works great. So for the IR size, we are still on a 10 by 12. Now, be careful once again, because look, this changes a little bit. If you remember on the AP hip, we did lengthwise. But when we go to a lateral hip, we're going to go ahead and change that to a crosswise cassette. Why? Because the way the leg lies to the side, I have to accommodate for that anatomy, make sure I'm not cutting it off. Make sure you turn that 10 by 12 cassette crosswise between those two exams. It's very important. You want to put a big star on that. It's a very easy thing to mix up. Small detail, but it makes a big difference because you're going to end up cutting anatomy off if you don't turn that crosswise. Once again, full, full field collimation. You don't have to actually collimate on a lateral hip. It's optional. If you just want to be a super tech and collimate. Hey, I encourage it, but it's not required. You can leave that light field completely open because you are covering a large amount of anatomy. And that hip area and the 10 by 12 should cover it well. Table bucky preferred, same thing, guys. If you do it portable, make sure you utilize, utilize a grid, clean up that scatter. Of course, if you're going to do a lateral hip portable, there's actually another method we're about to talk about that you would do over this method anyway. Most of the time, this is only going to be done in your department because the patient can actually put their leg in that position. If the femur is jacked up and fractured badly, we're going to opt for that wonderful Emilius Miller method. Same thing, guys. You want to go ahead and shield the gonads for males and females, particularly for your hip x-rays. It is required on males and females for that modified cleats, frog leg, lateral position. Okay, guys, so what of our, what's our evaluation criteria? Well, there we go, right there. We still want that entire femoral head. We want the neck. We want those trochanters centered to the IR. How do we do that? By putting that central ray directly on that femoral neck and with that crease of that leg. We also want to see the lesser trochanter completely visible in profile with the greater trochanter superimposed upon the femur and completely hidden. Very, very important. We also want the femoral head and neck in profile. That's going to tell us that it's a nice true lateral on that hip. And you will see there's a bit of a difference from the AP, where it is on the AP, we need to see the symphysis pubis. For the lateral frog leg, we don't need the symphysis pubis. We're only interested in that femoral portion and that hip joint. So make sure that SP, symphysis pubis, is on the AP. Don't need it for that frog leg lateral. We're mostly concerned with hip, greater trochanter superimposed, lesser trochanter in profile, with that nice, beautiful, open acetabulum, hip joint, femoral head, femoral neck. And here we go to the fun one. So, Mr. Fung tells me that you guys just absolutely love this X-ray. Y'all, y'all, it was like y'all's favorite. I mean, is that is that accurate, or is <laughs> some of you saying no? 
He said that you guys love this x-ray. I mean, y'all, y'all were confident. It didn't intimidate you. It was no problem. Is that, what Is that true? Hmm. Y'all be the first class I've heard say that. I guess a lot of people saying no. <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to tell Mr. Fong. I'm going to say, man, you lied to me. No, I won't embarrass you. I promise. Now, look. This, this can be a very tough x-ray, guys. But it's really not as bad as it looks. It looks terrifying. It looks terrible. It looks complicated. And yes, there's a lot more steps instead of a normal hip x-ray. But it's more of a mind over matter thing, guys. You're literally just lying right back up to that femoral head at the crease of the leg. They get you your cassettes right behind the patient's hip. They get you your lined up, two forty inches, and just shooting your x-ray. It looks more complicated than it is. So, yes, we got to do a cross-table beam, which can be a lot different than we're used to. But this actually produces a very beautiful x-ray if you do it right. I've done a lot of Denarius Miller x-rays. When I worked at Texas Children's, we had kids come in with broken hips all the time, and we could not do normal hip x-rays. So we always had to do these Denarius Millers, and they are invaluable, invaluable x-rays, beautiful x-rays when you do them right. So what are we going to do? Of course, it is going to be tabletop. Now, you will see on this picture, they have just a free cassette. I don't recommend doing this. I do recommend, if you're going to do a Denelius Miller, guys, that you utilize a grid. Because once again, the hip is very thick. You're penetrating a very thick area. You need that grid to clean up that image to increase that image quality. Very, very vital. Or it's going to be very, very washed out. The contrast resolution is going to be very low. It's going to be a very white, white image. It's not going to look good. So make sure you use that grid. So as far as the positioning, guys, we, of course, want the affected side to have a cassette right next to it with that cassette slightly turned to match the angle of the leg. And we want that central portion of the cassette. You see where that little marker is, that little line? That needs to line up with your femoral neck. Now, I suggest that you put your film by the leg first. Don't put your tube here first because that's going to confuse you. Put your film in the right location first, then move your tube into position. 40 inch SID, put your crosshair right on the mid femoral neck. By the way, look for the crease of the leg, just like you did for that frog lateral. Look for where the leg creases, that's the femoral neck. Put your crosshair right there. Make sure your vertical line lines up with your cassette. Make sure you're at 40 inch SID. And then of course, get that opposite leg out of the way. Now, you might have to have someone hold that leg. You'll see some techs put the leg on top of the x ray tube. There's multiple methods. I'll usually get a nurse or someone to help me out. I'll put a leg jacket on them and ask them to hold that leg out of the way for me. The more that leg's out of the way, the more a clear view you're going to get of that joint space, the more you're going to get that right on the money. Now, probably the biggest mistake people make is they start messing with their tube versus cassette. They forget to line the tube up to the cassette and they miss the anatomy. That's why I said put your cassette there first. Then look for the crease of that leg. Open up your collimation. Look for your vertical line. Vertical lines line up to the cassette. Crosshair is right on the crease of the leg. Make sure you close your collimation down once you're centered. Put your marker in the space you have. Boom, shoot your x-ray you got. You got a beautiful Amelia Miller x-ray. It really is a mind over matter exam, guys. It looks a lot more intimidating than it is. If you master this exam, it's going to save you so much headache when you get out there in the real world and start working. You're going to be able to rock out those lateral hips. And the radiologist is going to love you. They're going to absolutely love you if you master that exam. Now, make sure you know that this exam does have two different names. It's called an axiolateral hip, also called an inferior superior, I'm sorry, axiolateral inferior superior hip, also called a Demilius Miller method hip. Axiolateral inferior superior or Demilius Miller method hip x ray. Now, what do we want to see on this x-ray? Of course, same thing, guys, because we're looking for a lateral hip, so it's going to have very similar criteria to the lateral hip we just talked about. We want that entire femoral head, neck, and acetabulum completely visualized. No visible grid lines. We do that by achieving the correct techniques, by the way. Optimal exposure factor is very, very important. Make sure we're using a grid to clean up that scatter. Compensating filter recommended is talking about that grid, by the way. We want to go ahead and use a grid because it's a very thick area we are penetrating. Now, it's not written on the criteria, but just like with the hip x-ray guides, you see if this is a prosthesis, we want that entire prosthesis included on that lateral hip x-ray, or hip x-rays, period. You must have the entire prosthesis visualized. Very important, if this was cut off, we need to do a lower x-ray to get that entire 
prosthesis with some overlap. Now, one thing that also is not written here, you want to go ahead and write down, that criteria is just like with lateral hip. Therefore, we're going to see the lesser trochanter in profile with the greater trochanter superimposed upon the femur. Lesser trochanter in profile, greater trochanter superimposed. Tells it we have a nice, true lateral hip. Y'all still with me? Good? All right. Okay, so here's going to be some of our specialized positions here. We're not going to go into supreme detail on these, just more so the main facts you need to know. But these are some specialized views to look at different portions of the pelvis, depending on how we position the patient, as well as position the tube. First thing we're going to talk about is what we call the AP axial outlet projection. Also goes by the alternative name of Taylor method. Now, typically, when they do these specialized views, excuse me, they will order these as an outlet and inlet projection. They'll do both. We're going to go over both of them specifically. When we're talking about the AP axial outlet, first off, you see that word axial. Anytime you see that word axial, it's code for what? Tube angulation. But no, we're angling that tube. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to put the patient in a typical position like we would for a normal pelvis. But we're going to put a quite a sharp angle on our tube, and a cephalic angle. It's going to distort that pelvis in a way that allows us to visualize other parts of the anatomy we can't normally see on a typical AP pelvis. Now, there is a difference when we talk about male versus female. Now, as you guys remember with the anatomy, male and female pelvises are shaped differently. So we have to compensate for those different shapes by changing that angulation depending on if it's male or female. Now, put a big star on that, guys. That's important to remember right there. Because people forget that these angulations change between male and female on this outlet projection. For males, we're going to do a cephalic angle of 20 to 35 degrees. On females, it's going to be a 30 to 45 degree cephalic angle to compensate for that different shaped pelvis. Now, the CR is going to be quite low. Look how low the CR goes. The CR is going to be one to two inches distal to the symphysis pubis. Distal to the symphysis pubis. Now, there's a trick to that. You're already saying, well, how in the world am I going to figure that out? I can't palpate symphysis pubis. Remember how I was telling you guys to fill the side of the patient's hip to check for that femoral head and neck? Well, the femoral head and neck lines up very closely to the symphysis pubis. So if you find the head and neck of the femur, put your horizontal line along that location, you're at the level of the symphysis pubis. So you don't have to palpate on the patient. Don't palpate a patient's symphysis pubis. You're going to get slapped in the face. Don't do it. It's a very old school method. You don't do that anymore. I don't think they're going to appreciate you palpating there. So find that femoral head, put your horizontal line along that location, go two, one to two inches distal, and you're in the exact location for that outlet method. And don't forget that sharp angle. Now, why do you think we're sitting so much lower on that guy? This is a great question, by the way. Why is it so important that we're going so low on that x-ray? I mean, why? Why am I sitting by the symphysis pubis? That's certainly too low, right? What's the point of that? Anybody know? Because of elongation and uh, angulation as well. Very good, Asias. Very good. Because as I add that sharp angle, what's the anatomy do? It distorts and stretches out. And if you look once again, that's a very sharp angle on that tube. So it's going to really distort that pelvis. And we want to include as much of that pelvis as possible. So we're going to sit in a lot lower to accommodate that sharp angulation. And that's what it's going to look like right there, guys. You'll see we're not going to have the entire pelvis on there. We're more so interested in that area closer to the symphysis pubis, but we still want to include as much as possible. That's why we're staring so low. So what's the main things you're looking for for this outlet projection? The main things that we are magnifying and stretching out are the pubic and ischial bones specifically. We're looking for those obturator foramen to be nice and wide open like you see right here. Symphysis pubis is stretched out. The inferior ramus is stretched out. Ischial tuberosity is stretched out. It's, it's all distorted, but we want that to happen. That's why we're adding that angle. This is going to allow the doctor to get a much closer evaluation of this pubic and ischial area. 
pelvis. If they really suspect something funny is going on there, or they see some really bad fractures, bad anatomy, weird stuff going on, they're going to order these views, get a much closer magnified view of that specific area of the pelvis. What else are we looking for? Same thing as always, guys, no rotation of the pelvis. If that pelvis is rotated or oblique, guess what those obturated foramen are going to start doing? They're going to start getting real small and closed off. But you can see on the right, on the left side here, that's kind of happening just a tiny bit, tiny, tiny bit, very subtle. It's starting to close. That means that patient is slightly rotated with that left side elevated. We do want those pubic and ischial bones centered to the collimation filled. We achieve that by going right below that pubic symphysis like we just stated. And, of course, our optimal exposure factors, and much like a pelvis, guys, the shielding is the same concept. Males, it's required. Females, it's going to be optional. Be careful with the females. You got a question, Jonathan? I thought, look like you unmuted for a second. Never mind. I thought you unmuted. All right. So we're halfway through the class, guys. Let's take a quick five-minute break, and we will keep moving right along here. Let's come right back at 10.06, and we'll keep moving forward. See you guys in about five minutes.
All right, guys. Welcome back. Let's get logged back in. We're going to keep moving right along here. By the way, did everyone get the image, the practice images I sent last week? Good. So those are really, really good ones to study, guys. That pretty much hits all the major anatomy that you need to make sure of the next image review test. Mr. Donahue, do you think we can go over the um, names, like the names of the different, like, like AP the, posi the, the, the positions, yes. Yes. Let's see how much time we have here. Um... I don't have my phone on. I can't see what time it is. Thank, Thank you. Um, at 1030, guys, stop me if I'm still going, and we'll hit those positions before we dismiss, okay? All right. Okay, guys, so for the inlet position, now remember what I said. We have the outlet projection, but we also always will do an inlet projection as well. It's going to be the same concept. We're going to be stretching out that anatomy in that specified area to visualize a different part of the pelvis should the doctor suspect something weird is going on with that pelvic anatomy or some kind of pathology they need to get a better visualization of. But for the inlets, we're going to basically do the absolutely complete opposite of what we just did on the outlet projection. We're going to do a CR angle, a very sharp CR angle of 40 degrees caudad this time towards the feet. And this is going to be at the direct level of the as is. So two very different projections, but easy to mix those up. Make sure you know the difference between inlet versus outlet. On the inlet, we're doing a sharp 40 degree caudide angle at the level of as is to further stretch out a lot of that pelvic anatomy for better visualization purposes. Now you'll notice there's not a difference here on male and female for this one. They all share that same exact angle. So the difference between male and female only exists for the outlet projection, not for the inlet projection. We'll do a CR, 40 degree, call dead angle at the level of the ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine. What's that going to do? It's going to actually stretch out that inlet area where the sacrum is located. If you remember, that's called the inlet area. It's going to further stretch out that area a little bit for better visualization. <clears throat> and that's what it's going to look like right there. A little odd looking, right? Stretches that pelvis into a real funny shape. But it's going to really let us see this inlet area, which is this section right here where the sacrum is. All in here, it's going to stretch this out for a much better visualization. If they suspect there's some weird fractures they need to visualize or weird pathologies going on. So what do we want to see? We want those ischial spines to be demonstrated and equal. Ischial spines are right here, by the way. This actually, this view is going to help us demonstrate those ischial spines a lot more clear than a typical AP pelvis. You can see them very stretched out here. You can't see that. Let me draw it for you. These are our ischial spines right here. Much more prominent than it would for a normal AP pelvis. We want that pelvic inlet centered. Remember the pelvic in, the pelvic inlet is this area right here. This is the inlet area. So that's a little off center than where it should be, pretty close. We do want to go ahead and have some lateral collimation. Because we are going to stretch that beam out, we can afford to collimate horizontally just a little bit. Just make sure that you put it at the very edge of these greater trochanters. We don't want to cut those off. And by the way, speaking of greater trochanters, this is one of those great ways to know the difference on an x-ray, how these should look. If I had an inlet versus outlet side by side, let me go back. The outlet view is definitely centered right here at the pubic symphysis area. And look how extremely stretched out the obturator foramina are. That's the clue for outlet, by the way. Outlet has a big O. We're making big O's right here. Big outlet view. Let's go to the inlets. Inlet view, the obturator foramina shrink. They're very narrow. But look at those greater trochanters. They look like spikes. See that? 
Those very short hairs resemble big spikes. That's the way you can tell it's an inlet view right there. So look to the obturator foramina. Also look to those trochanters. It's two indications between those two types of x-rays. By the way, does anybody know what this is? Anybody know what that is? Nobody knows what that is. Is it the sigmoid or the rectum? It's sigmoid going to rectum. Rectum being okay. down here, sigmoid up here. But y'all y'all ready for one of my bad jokes? I don't know if I've told this one yet. You can tell me if I've told this one yet. Now, the actual technical terminology for this right here is what we call in medical imaging a UBF. The UBFs are very common in radiology. And you can find that in the, the Donahue Guide to Anatomy Positioning. No one knows what a UBF is? It's an un, unborn fart. Because that's gas in the colon. I know that's a terrible joke. Actually, my, my professor in x-ray school used to tell us that, so I stole that joke from her. You always call them UBFs. I had, to, I had to let y'all have the bad joke of the day. You gotta at least have one bad joke before Thanksgiving holiday, you know. It's requ required. So, you know, when you're hanging out with that radiologist, you can point out that's a UBF. It may not go over so well. I wouldn't suggest that. It'll look at you like you're crazy. Okay, so we also have some oblique views. Now, when we do these oblique views, they are posterior obliques, therefore they're LPO and RPO. Now, these are specifically done to visualize the acetabulum. We're going to open that acetabular area up a little wider, see that nice, beautiful hip joints. This also goes by the name of the Jude method. They also do these up here at Bone Clinic quite a bit. Now, depending on what we're looking at here, guys, we're going to, it depends on what hip we're looking at, by the way. So if we want to look at the upside hip, we're going to put that CR two inches distal to that elevated upside as is. It's going to be a 45 degree oblique, by the way, of the body, 45 degree oblique. And we're putting the CR two inches distal to that upside as is. If we want to visualize the downside acetabulum, we're going to put that CR two inches distal and medial to that downside as is. So, in other words, you could look at both. Uh, you could look at both acetabulums in one position. It depends on what they want to see: the upside versus the downside. If you look at downside, distal and medial to the downside as is, two inches. Upside or distal to that upside as is by two inches, and that's going to open up that acetabular area once again. Not done too often. They will order these every once in a while. They really suspect there's some major fractures going on real deep inside that hip joint within the acetabulum. That's why they would order these. Otherwise, you, most of the time you can visualize it just fine on a normal AP and lateral hip or pelvis x-ray. This would be more of those specialized views they may order. This was specifically for the acetabulum. Main thing to remember there, guys, main thing that if the registry was going to ask you a question on this would be, why do we do a posterior oblique Jude method view of the hip or pelvis? You would say to visualize the acetabulum opened up. That's the main point I want you to know on that view right there. So uh, is it, uh, can I assume that they're going to be LPO or RPO is just going to be based on um, the affected side? So effect, with the affected side, I'm assuming the up, the outside? Yeah, it, it really, it's kind of subjective because you can get both acetabulum on one oblique and it depends on what the doctor's looking for so it's really just how you want to position that patient for comfort levels so let's say that their um their right hips really hurting so you're going to support the right side you can still get both those acetabulums you just have to make sure you center correctly on the upside versus downside make sense yeah that makes sense thanks 
And that's what they're going to look like right there. It really doesn't look a lot different. I mean, it's just going to slightly open that acetone a little bit more. It's not going to be a huge difference, but it is going to slightly open up that hip joint, giving a much better visualization for that doctor if they, su if they suspect something funny is going on inside that hip joint very deep. Now, if we're looking at the downside, this is doing an RPO versus LPO, by the way, and you can reverse these to LPO, RPO, with either way, either way. If we're looking at those downsides, we do want to see that posterior realm and the anterior ischial column demonstrated. It's this area right here. Ischial is the combination of the ilium and the ischium. It looks a little superimposed. That's what we're going to get when we oblique that patient. If we're looking at the upside, we want the anterior realm and the posterior ischial column also demonstrated, as we see right here. But... Main point, once again, guys, when it comes to Jude view, the main big star thing I want you to remember is we're looking at the acetabulum better visualized. That's the main point. That's what they would ask you on the registry for that position. Okay, what time are we at, guys? We doing good on time still? 1021. 1021. 1021, okay, okay. So we do have another view here, guys. This is going to be what we call the modified axiolateral Clements Nakayama method. Boy, that's a mouthful. Say that one 10 times fast. Modified axiolateral Clements Nakayama method. Oof. So looking at this x ray, quiz time here. Why do you think we would ever want to do this x ray right here? What do you think we do that for? Think about it. I mean, like the bilateral fracture. Exactly. Not exactly. The clue is in the name itself. Look at the position of the patient. Look at what we're. They can move. For their central ray. Say again, Ms. Betty. Well, I was thinking of trauma. They can't move. You're on the right track. So think back to that Danilius Miller. Ringing any bells? They cannot lift up their leg, maybe? There you go. There you go. So this is basically a modified version of the Danilius Miller. Let's say that patient is just in horrible shape. We can't even touch the legs. We can't move the opposite leg out of the way. There's still a way that we can somewhat get a diagnostic x-ray. That's this method right here. That's why it's called the modified axiolateral because we're going to modify the method to acquire that axiolateral hip. So we're actually going to put a sharp angle on our tube and shoot downward towards that femoral neck in the hopes that we're going to project at least most of that femoral neck in a lateral position as possible. Now, by no means is this going to be an ideal position. It's going to be distorted. It's not going to be the prettiest, but it is a way that we can still get a semi-diagnostic lateral hip if that patient is completely unable to move, they can't move their legs, and moving that leg all the way is just not an option at all. So what are we going to do? We're going to do a seat central ray of 30 to 40 degrees medial lateral and 15 to 20 degrees posteriorly from horizontally. That looks like a mouthful right there. That's, that's really complicated. Basically, you're going to guesstimate this beam as best you can to line up with your cassette. I'll put it in simple terms for you. You're guesstimating where to put this beam in accordance to the cassette versus the femoral neck because you need to still be centered to the femoral neck. And you're making small adjustments to that beam to try to project as much of that head of that femur and neck on that cassette as possible. Because I can't move this leg out of the way. can't bring my tube down. So I'm going to project into it and try to throw that anatomy on that cassette as best as possible. So the technical way we would actually angle our tube is right here, 30 to 40 medial lateral and 15 to 20 posteriorly from horizontal. But this is more of a guesstimation to try to project as much of that femoral neck onto the film as possible. So what I want you to know on that is that's a mouthful. Some of these are irrelevant. What I want you to know is this is an alternative method to a trauma lateral hip if the patient cannot move their legs. So if I said, what's the alternative to a Danilius Miller hip? 
patients unable to move their legs, you'd send me a modified axiolateral or Clements Nakayama method. That's the main point on that. So don't break your brain trying to figure that out. Because this doesn't really apply anyway. There's a lot of adjustments you got to do that too to make that work. I've done this a couple times myself. And just from experience, they never turn out very well because it heavily distorts that anatomy. Sometimes it's all you can get. I hate to say the words that's all you can get because there should always be a way to get good images. But there are those instances where you've done everything you can. You've broke your brain every which way. That's the only way you can get that hip x-ray. you got to go for it and hope for the best. But that would be that alternative to that Cornelius Miller method. And as you can see, this is actually a very beautiful x-ray. They're not going to look like this. In fact, I have my doubts that's actually the same x-ray. I guarantee you this is actually a Danilius Miller they threw on there because you want it to look like a Danilius Miller. But I can tell you right now from experience, it's not going to look that pretty. It's going to be distorted. It's going to be ugly. It's not going to be near as beautiful as that x-ray right there. But the hopes are it's going to be as close to that x-ray as possible. Criteria is going to be the exact same thing as we talked about for that Amelius Miller with the entire femoral head and neck, trochanter centered to the IR with a lesser trochanter in profile, greater trochanter superimposed upon the femur, femoral head and neck in profile, and of course our optimal exposure factors, shielding, as with everything we've talked about so far, 40 inch SID, palmate down as you need. If there's a prosthesis, you need the entire prosthesis on there. So would I ask you to, to tell the difference between that on an x-ray? No. I want you to just remember that's an, I'd say, modified alternative method to acquiring that axiolateral to the Miss Miller hip x-ray. Perfect. Great stopping point, guys. So we'll go ahead and review those images real quick for positioning. When we come back on Monday, we will go over some radiograph critiques as well as some track questions and get you prepared for your test that's going to be on that Wednesday when we come back. Did someone have a question? I heard someone try to talk. It sounded like someone was about to talk. All right, give me a second. Let me pull up that image for you guys and we'll go over the position so you have that for studying. And we'll wrap this up today. Okay, ready guys, you got your sheets ready, write these down. Okay, well you tell me, what is that? You should all be able to tell me what that is. AP pelvis. pelvis. AP pelvis. And that's what you'd call right there, guys, a money shot x-ray. Not just for me, but for registry. They will put a picture like that on your registry. And there are so many questions they can ask on that one x-ray right there. Make sure you know that x-ray to a T. There's tons of anatomy. Every piece of anatomy on that x-ray is important to know. AP pelvis, guys. AP pelvis. All right. What is that one? Someone tell me. Is that the left um, unilateral frog leg? So it's not a frog leg. You're right about it being a unilateral. It's going to be a AP unilateral hip or unilateral AP hip. So for the lateral hip, it's actually going to look a lot different than that. I believe I have one on here for you guys to show you the difference. So same thing, guys. All this anatomy is very important. So all this anatomy on this x-ray. And also... Question real quick, <clears throat> is this properly positioned or is this properly centered? Yes. No. Is it a mess? No. Uh, it's a few no. It's just missing. Yeah. This oh, is pretty good. Uh, pubic symphysis is, is missing, so we need to actually repeat that x-ray. Even though the positioning's good, centering's okay, look at all this extra light over here. It could have moved that patient over more laterally to make sure they have that pubic symphysis on that x-ray. 
All right, what's this x-ray, guys? Proximal femur. It's proximal femur. What what view? Uh, AP. Good. Make sure you know that, guys. That's AP proximal femur. Don't mix that up with the AP hip. You guys see how the AP hip is centered just on the hip versus the AP femur? I've got all the shaft of the femur on there, or a lot of the shaft of the femur. Know the difference there, guys. That's easy to mix up. That's an AP proximal femur. <clears throat> What is this one, guys? Lateral, lateral femur? Distal lateral femur. distal femur. Thank you. It's a lateral distal femur. Make sure you have that entire name, guys, or it's on credit on the image review. That you can say it's a left lateral distal femur. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm scratching my throat. <clears> that is a left lateral distal femur. Make sure you put distal versus proximal. Those are completely different. Also, review your knee anatomy, guys. Some of you guys struggle with that knee anatomy. The knee is on the femur. Therefore, don't forget that knee anatomy. Make sure you review that on some of your previous images. Remember, everything we've learned so far, if it's overlapping on an image, it's fair game to ask. All right, what's that one, guys? AP distal femur. AP distal femur. Should do that entire name. AP distal femur. Now this is not one that not one for this chapter, but I put this in here, guys, just for your review. To make sure you remember that knee anatomy. Review that knee anatomy AP on the femur. That is an AP knee. I'm just showing that to you guys because if you have an AP distal femur. Guess what's on that AP distal femur? All this knee anatomy. Make sure. And there's there's the one, um, the lateral hip, guys. That wow! It's time for Thanksgiving. I can't talk. The lateral hip. This is the lateral unilateral leg hip, also known as the what method? The Taylor method. Taylor. Dane Miller. Clements. Oh. Clements Miller. Clements Miller. Danilius Miller is going to have a more distinct look. I'll show you. I think I have one on here. This is going to be your unilateral frog leg hip, also known as the Clements method. You can Clements method, or you can write unilateral hip leg. Both are acceptable. Know the difference between an AP hip and lateral hip, guys. The anatomy does change depending on how those trochanters are lying. And that's going to be the Danilius Miller there, guys. Danilius Miller will always be hung in this fashion where the femur is going horizontally. You'll also see the ischial tuberosity distinctly displayed. This is only part of the name, by the way, axiolateral hip. You can call it an axiolateral hip or Danilius Miller method hip. Both are acceptable. Axiolateral hip or Danilius Miller method hip. So now here, can you repeat the picture uh, just uh, about this one? Yeah, that's the that's the unilateral frog leg hip, also known as the Clements method. Is it? Clemens or Cleves? I'm sorry, Cleves. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay. You're right, it's Cleves. I apologize. Just a second, thanks. No, thank you for bringing it up. It's Cleves method. So sorry. Is it unilateral, Mr. Donahue? This is unilateral, correct. Thank you. I, I didn't include it. Make sure you know how to identify the bilateral pelvis as well. We're going to have both those both those hips in lateral position. So I'm going to try to throw some more images together for you guys. I'm going to throw some of those specialized ones as well and send them over to you as soon as I get a chance. So be expecting that in your email as well to study for the upcoming tests when we get back from the holidays.
But start studying hardcore on these images, guys, with this anatomy. Like I said, all this anatomy that's labeled these x-rays are very important to make sure you memorize for me and for your registry. Any other questions on these images? All right, guys. Well, if there are no more questions, that's going to do it for today. That's going to be it. Um, if you have any more questions, guys, you know where to find me. Text me, email me, whatever you need. Even though it's holiday, I'm always accessible if you guys need me for studying purposes. If you need, just let me know. If I do not see you guys again, please enjoy your holiday. Don't eat too much turkey and dressing. Don't go into a food coma. Trust me, it's a bad idea. I know personally. But have a blessed holiday, and I will see you guys when we all get back. Take care. Happy Thanksgiving.